My name is Greg Peterson. I'm the president of the Robert H. Jackson Center. And we're here for kind of an extraordinary opportunity to look into the minds and activities of the United States Supreme Court on the case of Brown versus Board II. Some preliminary matters, if you could turn off your cell phones, as you can see, we're recording this recording this uh, in an effort for our own posterity at the Robert H. Jackson Center, but also uh, folks at C-SPAN are very interested to know what this work product is. On May 17, 1954, in a decision commonly known as Brown versus Board of Education, the United States Supreme Court handed down a unanimous decision declaring the doctrine of separate but equal unconstitutional as it applies to public education. On the 50th anniversary of that decision, the Robert H. Jackson Center hosted a unique roundtable discussion among various law clerks who were there during that historic case. What the 1954 case did not do was to establish a remedy for integrating the schools. The Supreme Court immediately set about preparing to do so in a case commonly referred to as Brown versus Board of Education II. Today, in partnership with the United States Supreme Court Historical Society, the Robert H. Jackson Center is privileged to convene a roundtable discussion among the law clerks who were with the court during those deliber deliberations, which led to the May 31st, 1955 decision, which enunciated the concept of integration with all deliberate speed. We are here today because of the financial support of various corporate sponsors, including Allied Fire Protection Systems, Inc., Chautauqua Institution, the County of Chautauqua Industrial Development Agency, Cummins, Inc., HSBC Bank USA, Phillips Lytle, and as I mentioned, the Supreme Court Historical Society. We also have some special guests among us, not the least of which are the spouses of two of the participants, Betty Pollack and Jerry Davidson. Thank you for bringing up your spouses so they could participate today. Last night we were privileged to enjoy a wonderfully insightful presentation by Reverend Joseph Delane's daughter, Ophelia, Dr. Ophelia Delane Gona, and thank you very much for sharing that unique insight. Uh, which we also preserved for hopefully future generations. Soon we will be joined, as we are now, and I'm pleased to introduce uh, the esteemed William Coleman, who will be sharing tonight at a dinner at the Athenaeum Hotel the experiences of his involvement with the NAACP and the legacy of Brown versus Board. Thank you, Mr. Coleman. To lead us through the discussion, I'm honored to introduce St. John's University Professor of Law, John Q. Barrett, who is also the Robert H. Jackson Center's first, and hopefully for a long time only, Elizabeth S. Linnae Fellow. A little bit about Professor Barrett. He discovered, edited, and introduced Justice Jackson's That Man an insider's portrait of Franklin D. Roosevelt. That man, Jackson's previously unknown and never published memoir of FDR in the New Deal, has become a nationally acclaimed bestseller and is now available in paperback, and it will also be available at tonight's dinner. Barrett, a graduate of Georgetown University and Harvard Law School, was a law clerk to Judge A. Leon Higginbotham, Jr. of the United States Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit, as and an associate counsel in the Office of Independent Counsel, Lawrence E. Walsh for the Iran-Contra affair, and counselor to the Inspector General in the United States Department of Justice. John is writing a biography of Justice Jackson that will include the first inside account of Jackson's year away from the Supreme Court as the United States prosecutor of the principal surviving Nazi leaders at the International Military Tribunal in Nuremberg. Professor also writes and speaks regularly about that man. We are honored and privileged to have John Barrett moderate this unique roundtable discussion. John, 
On behalf of the Robert H. Jackson Center and the Supreme Court Historical Society, I'm pleased to welcome you today to Lene Theater here on the grounds of Sh historic Chautauqua Institution. 51 years and one day ago, the Supreme Court decided Brown versus Board of Education. But that decision on May 17, 1954, in fact, did nothing more than announce that whatever the meaning of the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause once had been, it no longer meant, it no longer permitted separate but equal racial segregation in the realm of education. At the end of that opinion for a unanimous Supreme Court, Chief Justice Earl Warren announced that the cases we know as Brown, in fact, there were five cases, four from states, Kansas, of course, Virginia, South Carolina, and Delaware, and a fifth case from the District of Columbia, would be restored to the court's docket for the next year when the court would hear additional argument on the implementation of the decision that had just been announced. In other words, what would the remedy be? How would the court direct the states and the federal government to implement the new decree of Brown versus Board of Education that separate but equal now constitutionally had no place in the realm of public education? Chief Justice Warren, in that May of 1954, also invited additional briefing, not only from the parties to the five cases known as Brown, but also from all interested states, which would be affected by and work to implement the new regime that the court had just announced. Thus culminated the next 12-month period that we know as the year of Brown versus Board of Education II. We're here this morning 50 years later, to discuss that final and perhaps most significant part of the Brown case in the Supreme Court of the United States. And we're very privileged to have with us four distinguished attorneys who were present on the inside of the Supreme Court process for that year of deciding Brown versus Board of Education II. On my immediate right, I'm pleased to introduce Mr. Gordon Davidson. He is a graduate of Center College, the University of Louisville Law School and Yale Law School, after which, and U.S. Army service, he served as a law clerk to Justice Stanley Reed during that 1954-1955 term of the Supreme Court. Mr. Davidson subsequently returned to his native Louisville, Kentucky, where he went into private practice with the law firm of Wyatt, Tarrant, and Combs, which he rose to become the chairman of and has served in a variety of very distinguished positions, both in the private and public philanthropic sectors in Kentucky. It's a pleasure to welcome Gordon Davidson. <laughs> to Mr. Davidson's right is Earl Pollack. Earl Pollack, a native of Iowa, is a graduate of the University of Minnesota and Northwestern University's School of Law. In 1953, he became a law clerk to the Chief Justice of the United States, Fred Vinson. Chief Justice Vinson passed away only two months later, and perhaps after a moment or a week or two of uncertainty, uh, Earl Pollack then became one of the first law clerks in the first term of Chief Justice Earl Warren heading the Supreme Court of the United States. Mr. Pollack was there for that first year, culminating in Brown 1 and he stayed for a second year as a law clerk, culminating in the Brown II decision that we're here to discuss this morning. Following his Supreme Court clerkship, Earl Pollack served in the Department of Justice and then moved to Chicago, where he went into private practice with the law firm of Sun and Shine, Knaff, and Rosenthal, and uh, principally focusing on business and antitrust law. Uh, Mr. Pollack is now senior counsel to that firm, resides in Sarasota, Florida, has just completed, I'm told, a term as chairman of his symphony board, uh, and it was part of our discussion last year of Brown 1. It's a pleasure to welcome Earl Pollack back for this year's roundtable. <laughs> to Mr. Pollack's right is Professor Daniel Metter. Dan Metter is a native of the state of Alabama and a graduate of Auburn University and the University of Alabama and Harvard Law School. After service in the Korean War and service in the Judge Advocates General Corps of the Army, he became a law clerk to Justice Hugo Black of the Supreme Court, arriving in the summer of 1954 and serving during the year that is the Brown II year. Following his Supreme Court clerkship, 
Mr. Metter uh, became a law professor at the University of Virginia and with a stint as dean of the University of Alabama Law School, then returned to Virginia and has made a very distinguished career in academia. He took time for public service also, serving as an assistant attorney general of the United States, and today is a professor of law emeritus at the University of Virginia School of Law. It's a pleasure to welcome Professor Metter this morning. And to Mr. Metter's right is E. Barrett Prettyman, Jr. Barrett Prettyman, a native of Washington, D.C., is a graduate of Yale University and the University of Virginia School of Law. Following law school, Barrett Prettyman became a law clerk to Justice Robert H. Jackson, a native of this region and, of course, the person whose life and legacy are commemorated by the Robert H. Jackson Center. Barrett Prettyman was Jackson's final law clerk. He was a solo law clerk during the court's 1953-1954 term and worked with Jackson very closely until Jackson's sudden death in October of 1954. Following Jackson's death, Barrett Prettyman became temporarily a law clerk in the, justice, in the chambers of Justice Felix Frankfurter. And then in 1955, when Jackson's successor, Justice John Marshall Harlan, was confirmed, Barrett Prettyman became one of his initial law clerks and was with Justice Harlan during the process culminating in the decision of Brown II. Following his clerkship, Barrett Prettyman went into private practice in Washington, D.C. with the law firm of Hogan and Hartson. He also has served in the public sector, in the U.S. Department of Justice, in the government of the District of Columbia, and he is today a senior partner at Hogan and Hartson. It's a pleasure to welcome Barrett Prettyman back to Jamestown area and the Chautauqua Institution. <coughs> To put just five more names before you, and then I will begin the conversation, these gentlemen each represent one justice, and that, of course, is four of nine. The other five members who comprised this Warren Court during the year 1954-1955 are names well known to many of you, uh, and of course extremely well known in their time across the country. Justice William O. Douglas was a Roosevelt appointee, had been on the court since 1938. Justice Felix Frankfurter was also a Roosevelt appointee, had been on the court since 1939. Justice Harold Burton was Roosevelt's last appointee. He had been on, I'm sorry, he was President Truman's first appointee. He had been on the court since the summer of 1945. And Justice Tom Clark was a Truman appointee. He had been on the court uh, since 1948. Finally, uh, Justice Sherman Minton, was serving on the court. He was the junior associate justice, also an appointee of President Harry Truman. That was the Warren Court that confronted the segregation issue, first in Brown, and then the remedy question in Brown, too. I'd like to turn to each of you and get a bit of personal flavor on who your boss was and how it came to be that you were a Supreme Court law clerk. I'll turn to you first, Earl Pollack. And Fred Vinson will be a background figure, but you might tell us a bit about him, and then, of course, tell us about your coming to be the clerk of Earl Warren, the Chief Justice. Well, as you indicated, uh, John, I came to the court in June 1953 uh, to work as a law clerk to Chief Justice Vinson. Unfortunately, uh, that proved to be uh, uh, of short duration because uh, in uh, September 1953, in fact, the same weekend that my wife and I had just driven him home to uh, his apartment at Wardman Park Hotel, uh, he died and uh, was approximately oh, three weeks or so before, while we were uh, on tenter hooks, uh, sort of waiting to decide whether I was going to start my uh, practice much sooner than I had expected because uh, I might not be reappointed, but then uh, uh, Earl Warren was appointed uh, to succeed Vinson, and uh, he asked me and the other two Vinson clerks to uh, continue as his clerk. Uh, Vinson was, of course, a radically different type of person than uh, Earl Warren. Uh, both. Vincent and Warren were politicians in every sense of the word. Uh, 
but uh, Warren was much more of a, shall we say, a public personality, uh, enormously popular in uh, California. So far as I know, he's the only uh, Californian who ever was nominated by both the Democratic and Republican parties uh, for the position of uh, governor. Uh, he had a very commanding presence. Uh, he uh, seemed to be instantly liked by almost everyone that he came in contact with, whether it be uh, other justices of the court or uh, law clerks or messengers or chauffeurs or whatever. Uh, he had uh, very much of a common touch and it was a great experience working for him. I, I was pleased that uh, he asked me to continue for a second year as his law clerk, uh, whereupon I then achieved the, the most distinguished title that I've ever had in my entire life, and that was chief law clerk to the Chief Justice of the United States. <laughs> Every, everything since then has been downhill. <laughs> Barrett Prettyman, let me turn to you, and uh, you'll have to really do this three times, but for now, double duty. Could you introduce us a bit to Robert Jackson and also to Felix Frankfurter and tell us about the process by which you became a law clerk? Uh, Robert Jackson was an absolutely wonderful person to work for and particularly to be his only clerk because I didn't have to deal with, with uh, another clerk uh, uh, doing part of my work. Uh, it was a busy time. I had to write uh, certain memos in all of the cases that uh, we got a term. He asked me to stay a second term and we were beginning that when he uh, very suddenly passed away. In an unpublished opinion, which he assumed he would be writing concurring opinion, while Vincent was still alive, he referred to the decree a couple of times and primarily seemed to think that it would be Congress's task to deal <clears throat> with the school situation now that the court had ruled. He didn't go into any great detail about that. Frankfurter uh, was, uh, Justice Frankfurter was in my office a lot while Jackson was alive. Uh, he uh, proselytized me <laughs> under the mistaken assumption that I would have some say in getting Jackson to do one thing or another. But uh, he, in any event, as soon as Harlan was appointed, uh, got hold of Harlan and suggested it would be a good idea to come to the court with somebody who was already there, and he was the one who talked him into hiring me, virtually sight unseen. <clears throat> Harlan uh, immediately, immediately became interested in the decree problem and asked me to write uh, a memo to him which I did, it's exactly 50 pages long, uh, summarizing each of the cases, the positions that the parties were taking on all pending questions, everything from should there be a master appointed uh, to run the cases, uh, what role should the local school board have, should there be immediate compliance, et cetera. Uh, and he, he asked me not only to summarize the briefs, but to state my own views about the decree which I uh, did. So then he uh, finally came down before he was actually a member of the court and uh, we met and we talked. And what a wonderful person he was too. A lawyer's lawyer, judge's judge. He was uh, very bright and serious, uh, not in the sense of having no sense of humor, but very serious about his work. Okay. Well. We, we will, of course, come back to him. Um, Gordon, let me turn to you. Stanley Reed was a longtime veteran of the court by the time you arrived. Uh, give us a sense of him. Well, of course, he was uh, from Kentucky uh, and uh, had served, uh, interestingly enough, he got into Washington. You asked, I believe, how you got to be a law clerk, uh, but let's go with Reed a minute. Uh, he was brought to Washington in 1929 by Herbert Hoover. Now, Reed, of course, was, a, was an adamant Democrat, uh, 
but he was brought uh, there because of his expertise in uh, the farm area. He was a, a practicing lawyer in Maysville, Kentucky, and he knew the tobacco business and the farm business pretty well. So Hoover uh, brought him up as counsel to the Farm Credit Bureau, where he served for a number of years. And uh, after that, Hoover appointed him to the uh, Federal Reconstruction uh, uh, agency which had just been formed to take care of the banks and the difficulty we were having during the depression. And so he was in that capacity as counsel uh, when Roosevelt was elected. And uh, uh, he always said that the only reason that he got to be a Supreme Court justice was because when he went to a meeting at the White House with Roosevelt for the first time, a young man, or not a young man, but a man uh, met him at the door and said, Stanley, you don't remember me, but he said, I was in, in prep school with you. And uh, Stanley said, oh, well, that's great, uh, you know. And he went back and he said, he's sure that for the next four years, that fellow always remembered Roosevelt of his old prep school friend. <laughs> so he always felt that he had a leg up because of a, uh, of a, a friend in the White House. But uh, he was appointed, of course, by Rose, well, he became Solicitor General. Actually, he, he earned his spurs, I suppose, by the famous Gold Clause case, uh, which uh, he was Assistant Attorney General for in that case, and he won that case in which uh, all the bonds that said you were entitled to get paid in gold if you wanted to, and uh, suddenly after that case, you couldn't get paid in gold. I never quite understood the rationale of that case. But at any way, the justice was successful and became Solicitor General, and from there uh, argued most of the uh, early uh, New Deal cases on behalf of the Roosevelt administration. And in 1938, he was appointed uh, by Roosevelt to the Supreme Court and served for 19 years thereafter. Uh, he obviously was very interested and very involved in both Brown I and Brown II, and I guess we'll get to that a little later. We, we will definitely get to that. Dan, Dan Metter, let me turn to you. Justice Hugo Black was uh, also from the South. He was from the Deep South, Alabama, as you are. Um, introduce us a bit to your boss, Hugo Black. Well, he had uh, been elected to the United States Senate in 1926 from Alabama. So I grew up knowing who he was and hearing a lot about him. And actually, I aspired to become his law clerk even long before I went to law school because two uh, men older than I was from my hometown had been his law clerk. So I, I knew of the position of law clerk, uh, and it sounded like a pretty interesting thing to do. So that had been in my mind all the way through, and eventually it uh, worked out that way. He appointed me. He was uh, Roosevelt's first appointment to the Supreme Court in 1937, which was a rather startling event to much of the legal world. I think most people had not uh, thought of him as the ideal candidate after four or five years of no appointments uh, for Roosevelt to pick him as the first. Uh, when I arrived in the uh, summer of 1954, he had been there 17 years and was the senior associate justice. Uh, he ended up serving 34 years on the court uh, he was a great person to work for, very personable, uh, friendly, amiable, warm, uh, willing to engage his uh, clerks in a lot of uh, uh, very heated but friendly uh, disputation over issues and whatnot, and uh, it was a grand experience. Uh, as far as the subject of this panel goes, Brown II, I'm not going to be able to add a whole lot here because Justice Black never discussed the case, and this was true of the previous year leading up to Brown I. Uh, and I've talked about this over the years with his two clerks from that year, one of whom was David Vann, who later became Mayor of Birmingham, and the other was Charlie Wright, who gained fame later as the author of The Greening of America. Uh, they actually lived at Black's house for that year, uh, and he never discussed the case with them at all, and they never saw a piece of paper relating to it. It was as though it did not exist, and the same carried through in, in my year there. He just did not discuss the case. 
Uh, my, so I'm not going to be able to add a whole lot to that, but I'm delighted to be here. <laughs> well, you'll, you'll, you're understating your contribution, as time will prove. Um, the silence of Justice Black was not, I think, a personal foible. It was part of a context in which Chief Justice Warren and the Associate Justices handled the Brown litigation as a very confidential matter, even within the confidentiality of the court. Um, Earl and Barrett, you were there for that first year. Could you describe that dynamic of, of secrecy, delicacy, and so forth? Well, I think uh, a good example of it is the fact that some law clerks did not know that Brown was coming down. Uh, it had, uh, had, had been the decision day. On decision day, yeah. Um, no, it, it, was, it was very confidential, and um, there were strict orders from the top um, that it was not to be discussed with anybody. Um, and the clerks who were working on it uh, um, were not to discuss it with their wives or anybody else. So um, I, I, I'm not sure exactly why there was, this was not, a, a, after all, a national security case or something. I'm not sure why uh, the Chief Justice was so adamant about it, but uh, as Earl can tell you, um, what is your impression as to how many clerks were actually working on the case uh, in any way at all? Well, on the decree, there was a committee of six of us who, who worked on the decree. But for the main opinion, I never did know exactly how many worked on it and how many didn't. Now, as far I, as I, I did, only because of right. Jackson gave me his unpublished opinion. The initial decision of the court, which probably was stimulated by Warren himself, who was very much concerned about uh, uh, newspaper leaks, uh, an initial uh, agreement among the justices was that uh, none of the clerks, other than the chief's own clerks, mm -hmm. would uh, be involved in any way. Uh, several of the justices as we know, uh, <laughs> honored that agreement only <laughs> in the breach, and there were justices uh, like uh, Jackson who uh, I think shared his views with, with Barrett, and this may, I think, uh, may, uh, I, I don't, I'm not even sure it was true in, in Frankfurter's uh, uh, chambers. There was a good deal of emphasis on uh, maintaining security uh, for example, uh, the usual routine in the court is that every draft of a, an opinion that is going to be distributed to justices is sent down to the Supreme Court's own print shop. And uh, the drafts are distributed to the justices in printed form, uh, galleys, uh, sometimes called. In this instance, that was ruled out. Everything was done in typed form. In addition, even messengers were kept out of this. Uh, when the time came in early May 1954 to distribute the first draft of uh, Brown One, uh, Warren personally delivered copies to each justice in the building. He personally took a copy to Justice Jackson in the hospital, and uh, another clerk and I personally delivered copies to uh, Minton at his apartment and to Justice Black, who was playing tennis at the time when we arrived at his Alexandria home. <clears throat> So a security was regarded as uh, very, very important, and uh, there's no question that in the chief's office uh, we were repeatedly admonished that this was not something that we were to discuss with other law clerks. That in itself would be quite unusual because mm. the normal procedure would be that at lunch or in uh, private conferences, uh, there would be a good deal of interchange among clerks about what do you think about this or do you think that draft uh, is any good and then so on. Not, me, not so you, with Brown One. Let me ask you about that. You know, we had the, the clerk's private dining room downstairs where 
the 18 of us gathered most days for lunch. My recollection is, and you can correct me on this, I never recall hearing this case discussed at lunch with the clerks. I'm not surprised because I know uh, the chief's clerks would have been, would have been absolutely uh, silent in any, any such discussion and probably uh, might have even gone so far as to say that any discussion of that sort is out of bounds. Is that your memory of the lunchroom also? Well, uh, you're confusing Brown 1 and Brown 2. Yeah, uh, big difference, big difference. Uh, <clears throat> Brown 1 was the one with the great secrecy. Okay. Uh, now, uh, just a footnote, uh, not a personal knowledge, but a footnote to Earl's <coughs> comments. Uh, in those uh, chambers of justices who had trouble with Brown 1, including Justice Reed and Justice Jackson uh, and Clark to some degree. Um, I was not there, so this is secondhand knowledge. But in those, in those uh, uh, chambers, there was a good deal of interchange between the justice and the law clerks. Right. That was not true of the other uh, right. uh, justices who were pretty well signed right. on uh, originally. So there was a good bit of that. But the same sort of uh, uh, culture was on those uh, law clerks uh, in regard to even those who have trouble with the decision. Right. That, that's Brown 1. Now, Brown but 2. Brown, Brown two, 2 is the cafeteria process. Yeah, Brown, is Brown 2, uh, my recollection, subject to uh, better memories by my colleagues, uh, Brown 2 did not have the same type of terrible you're, you're, uh, you're, abs you're absolutely right. Uh, culture. And, Big uh, difference. The, uh, the lunchroom, which is worth noting, there is a private lunchroom in the Supreme Court building for the law clerks. And fortunately, uh, they, they, they uh, uh, test it for uh, bugs and sound uh, every day. Um, and it's a good thing because if, if you had a tape recorder in that lunchroom, uh, uh, Goodness knows what would happen to this country. <laughs> but I, I want to make sure we're clear on this. Dan, your memory of that lunchroom during the Brown II year, which is the year you're yes. on court as a law clerk, right. uh, is that this was not a lunchroom topic. I do not recall ever having heard it discussed. My mem mem memory may be faulty, and I'd be happy to be corrected, but I do not recall any discussion in the lunchroom of the case. Okay. Do Gordon, I'd like to, uh, if I could drop yeah. a footnote to one thing that you said. Mm -hmm. uh, Justice Jackson did not have trouble with the result mm -hmm. in Brown. He had a lot of trouble with how they were going to get there and what they were going to say. Uh, uh, that, that's it, also he, true of Reed. Yeah, Reed had wrote, no trouble with the result. Uh, he certainly believed that Plessy should be overruled, but it was a question of how and when. <clears throat> Well, I'm certainly he was there by May, by May of 1954, uh, and they are all unanimously part of that decision. I, I want to start at that moment, or maybe the next day, the morning after Brown versus Board of Education. Two of you are law clerks, and two of you are about to be law clerks, but you're on the outside. Uh, let's start on the outside. What was your sense of what this meant for the country and for the court that you would be working at during this next year? Well, of course, I was in the Korean War and JAG at that time, <laughs> and uh, that wasn't the top on our agenda. But uh, we were all uh, delighted, uh, enthralled. I mean, uh, I, I knew no one who didn't agree with the basic uh, decision, that is, of my colleagues and friends and lawyers. So uh, that part of it was, was very easy. Uh, but uh, it, it wasn't until really I got to the court that uh, you had to really get into it to find out what all the problems were. And back to Barrett's point uh, about uh, Justice Jackson, it was true of Reed also uh, to a slightly different degree, but his concern, which brings up Brown too, was not so much the decision that uh, equal opportunity, that uh, separate but equal had to go, it was a question of when and how. And he was more interested or more concerned with how uh, than anything else. And I'm sure a lot of the other justices had this problem. It was uh, it, it, having made the decision in Brown 1 that schools 
needed to be, all public schools had to be desegregated. Uh, it, it was very much like, in my <laughs> opinion, like the dog chasing the ambulance who catches the tire and finally gets hold of the ambulance and doesn't know what to do with it. Uh, not that they didn't know what to do with it, but they didn't know how exactly to do with it. So I would say that really Brown too had a lot more uh, difficulties in in way, not, not, not controversy between justices particularly or antagonisms like Brown one did, but uh, there was great concern among all the justices on now that we've caught the tire, what do we do with it? And uh, how, do we, how do we make this thing work? And I think they were all concerned with that. I know Reed, uh, Justice Reed had more concern with how uh, than he did uh, the, the Brown one. He, he, was, he was more concerned and more fearful of what possibilities could occur if it was not done properly. Uh, insurrections, uh, strikes, uh, bloodshed, uh, all, all types of horribles if, if it were done badly. So don't forget that uh, the briefs were all the way from the plaintiffs who were asking for immediate, complete action, desegregate now, we're entitled to our rights, you've said we have constitutional rights, you don't spread them out, you don't delay them now. The briefs all the way to uh, South Carolina and Florida and a couple of others that were in effect uh, thumbing their nose at the court, uh, both at oral argument and in the briefs, uh, indicating that there may, nothing may ever happen. Mm -hmm. Dan, fr from the outside, as your cl clerkship was approaching and the court reached this decision, what was your sense of what the court had bitten off and what this Brown II process was really about? Well, <clears throat> it opened up to me an enormous and immense sort of chasm uh, to, how, to see how this thing was going to be carried out, implemented, what the impact was going to be. It was the enormity of the thing is what immediately impressed me. Uh, I just uh, had difficulty foreseeing how it would all work out. Were uh, you, uh, obviously you were at Harvard Law School, but were yeah. you getting a direct feel for the Alabama reaction to Brown versus Board of Education? Well, of course, as you say, I was at the Harvard Law School at that moment. Uh, the, uh, when I went back to Alabama that summer, uh, between uh, the end of the academic year and uh, arriving with Justice Black, and uh, there obviously was enormous uh, uh, upset and objection to it down there, although as I look back on it, that summer was relatively uh, quiescent on the subject. Uh, mm -hmm. It was as though they were waiting for the other shoe to drop mm -hmm. uh, with Brown too, uh, but uh, there was uh, enormous uh, uh, objection to it basically. I mean, you, I, I didn't run into anybody who approved of it in Alabama. But <laughs> I think my, my perception is just a little bit different. Uh, I think the, uh, the shoe being dropped was already in the air uh, <laughs> at the time that Brown won was decided. Uh, unanimity of the court was absolutely essential in the view of the Chief Justice and I think in the view of uh, the other justices of the court. In fact, I think it was the need for unanimity that uh, uh, Warren uh, exploited with justices like Reed in order to induce them to uh, join in Brown 1. And they would not have done so, clearly in my mind, unless it had already been determined by the justices that uh, the the decree would be implemented on a, on a gradual basis. I don't think there ever would have been a unanimous decision unless there was already a clear understanding that that is the way that uh, it would have to be done because of uh, fear of violence, school closings, fear of uh, the court issuing an order that it could not enforce uh, fear that the prestige of the court uh, 
in that event would take a, a terrific licking. There really, as I saw it, there were really three issues in the Brown litigation. One is separate but equal to be accepted. And second, is it to be done on a gradual basis? And third, what are the instructions to give to the district courts in carrying out gradual transition? In my mind, the first two issues were determined in the 53-54 term, leaving only the determination of what instructions to give to the uh, uh, district courts. As far as I uh, would understood it, there was not any chance whatsoever that a, the, the court would ever issue a forthwith decree. I don't think it was ever seriously considered uh, by anyone. Uh, the only uh, footnote, I guess, on that is that Black took the position that desegregation in the South would probably never take place, but that uh, the court in Brown II should exclude any reference to class actions and should order admission of the handful of named plaintiffs. And Douglas went along with that. And that was really the only change that was made in the Chief Justice's draft of Brown too, that was circulated to the other justices. It, it, Barrett, go ahead. Well, th there was an added factor that came in here that uh, was not apparent, I don't think, certainly in our chambers, uh, at the time of the original decision. I had always naively assumed that people went to schools because they were in a school district that was sort of like a congressional district with clearly drawn lines uh, except without the gerrymandering, and, uh, and that you, you went to the school within your district, and therefore, you know, it was going to be a relatively simple thing to readjust that. And during the work that I did on the Committee of Six, uh, I discovered that there were at least five, at least five different methods of deciding uh, where you went to school, including all the way from open choice to uh, uh, strict districting, to loose districting with lives intercrossing, and, and uh, uh, some areas being determined by where the railroad tracks ran or a stream ran or something. Uh, and, and it became quite clear that there was no way that you were going to write a decree that was going to tell each district judge how to work all this out. Because, for example, you had to have the entire bus structure uh, redone. You had to have, in many cases, the legislature dealing with a new tax system because many uh, uh, Negro sections uh, were taxed differently than white sections. Uh, school boards, you had to uh, figure out what to do. And what about teachers? What were you going to do? It's one thing you're talking about students, but what about the teachers? Were you having Negro teachers now teaching uh, uh, classes that were largely white but not entirely. What, uh, how were you going to deal with all this? And, and that's part of what our memos dealt with to the court, which I guess you're going to come to a little that, later. That's the topic I want to go to next. And really, Earl has introduced this a bit uh, with a helpfully direct and I think provocative statement that Brown II uh, is a bit of an anticlimax or a fait accompli uh, given Brown I. Well, I wouldn't want to uh, understate the importance of the issues that had to be decided as to how it should be implemented and how the district court should decide this. Those were very significant issues, but uh, I don't think that the court really had on its agenda at that time, should there be forthwith admission or should there not be forthwith admission. The, there had been essentially a commitment to people like Reed, Clark, and others who were desperately concerned about Frank how this, 
you asked Frank for how this could be implemented. So there was a, a commitment uh, that was, I think, unshakable that the implementation would be done on a gradual basis. And then there were these important questions, uh, additional questions about, okay, it's going to be done on a gradual basis. Now, how do we try to advise or direct the district courts to carry out this very awesome task? What kinds of instructions or conversations do you recall with your justices during that summer of 1954 uh, as this moves forward? And it includes the creation of this committee of law clerks that went to work. Uh, a couple of you were part of that process and a couple of you were not. But the justices tend to leave Washington for the summer and the clerks uh, tended to have this among other projects that they were working on. So let, what, what let, was the introduction or the instruction you received? Let, let's talk about the Committee of Six for a minute, which has a little interesting history. Justice Reed was more concerned, as I said earlier, with what would happen after you overruled Plessy than overruling Plessy. That was not his big problem. His big problem was how do we do it and when do we do it. Uh, and there's no question that uh, Chief Justice Warren was the guy who got unanimity in the court. I, I want to give credit to that on the way by. He, he absolutely got it in both Brown 1 and Brown 2, and he deserves a tremendous amount of credit. But let's go to the committee. Back before they argued Brown 1, uh, Reed became very fascinated, according to Jack Fassett, my predecessor clerk, with what has happened in other places that have had integration or desegregation, let's put it that way, desegregation is more a fitting term. And uh, so he had Facet uh, and probably his other clerk, a fellow named George Mickham, start doing research on places that have had this problem uh, or where they've done desegregation. And he began to collect through the clerks a, a tremendous amount of material. And uh, in the summer, after the decision uh, of Brown won, he suggested to Jack Fassett, the clerk who was my predecessor, who broke me in, so to speak, that he take this material to the Chief Justice and show the Chief Justice what he had collected. And it was a great uh, bulk of work. Well, uh, Warren took it uh, very gracefully and, and, and wanted it and read it. And shortly after that, Barrett, is when he appointed the Chief Justice, the six of us. I was one. You were one. Uh, I don't remember. Were you one? or No, I wasn't. Uh, well, there were six of us. That is a clerk from each justice. He didn't take two from any one justice. Right. And basically, your bosses had volunteered you up. Absolutely. Uh, when the chief justice. <laughs> there was no question about that. <laughs> there was, there was no appeal. Do, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he said, go, you went. Uh, so we started work, and we divided up our workload, and so on and so forth. And then we go to Barrett's final point to speed things up. Of, Having done all this work, I remember I had Cairo, Illinois. I, I, I remember that distinctly because Cairo being uh, not one of the uh, southern states, but one that had problems similar to it. Uh, and we, the Ford Foundation, you recall, came out with a paper then. Uh, they had endowed a paper to collect this material on places that had had desegregation. What were their problems? What did they run into? Uh, so we worked and worked and worked and worked, and we had a, I don't know, how, how would you say it was that high? Uh, we had a lot of material. Huh? We had a lot of material. It, it, we had more material, and I don't know what's ever happened to it. I guess it's up in Washington gathering dust somewhere. It's in various archives, I think. Now, yeah. some pieces of this project included uh, a study of many maps. I That's think right. that was the part that Barrett yeah, was Yeah, my job to. was to try to show where... Uh, Negroes and whites lived in particular right. areas. The principal map, for example, was of Spartanburg, South Carolina. And there weren't many maps like that around, but I was able to get a number of them. And um, because by showing where the homes were and where the schools were, you could get some idea of how much of a 
relocation and so forth there would be if you actually desegregated. And um, I, so I, uh, I did a, a memo for the court, which was seen by all the justices. They signed off on it, on the, the point of the maps. And, and the principal point that I made was the one I mentioned a few minutes ago, that there were a lot of different systems <laughs> going on out there and a lot of different problems to deal with. All right. Now, Gordon, your, your piece, uh, which I think was part of what Justice Frankfurter, among others, had suggested to Chief Justice Warren, a study of how northern locales had done right. uh, uh, integration efforts. Frankfurter was very interested in the work of, of uh, the clerks, more so because he, of course, stayed in Washington during the summer, and that's when we were doing our work. Uh, and he was very interested in that and had some participation in it. He didn't try and guide us in any way, but he, he was very interested and very much in favor of it, as was Reed. Reed thought we ought to gather as much information as we possibly possibly could. Back to Earl's point, too, uh, there is no question that what he said is exactly correct, uh, and that is there's no way you could have gotten unanimity without, uh, and now I come to the, the great phrase, all deliberate speed. Uh, that was a phrase that I think Earl sold most of the other justices. I mean, uh, it, it, at least it was what they wanted, what Frankfurter wanted, what Reed wanted. Would, Not I, the words, but I that's mean right. the, the principle. The, the substance of that. Forget the words. I'm, right, I'm right. using the words right. only to introduce, right, right. To introduce the point. Now, I think we ought to bring it up uh, a little bit to today. Uh, that, you know, I thought, so my naive way, uh, that it was a wonderful order. I liked it. I thought all deliberate speed and the way the Chief Justice had phrased it and, and so forth, I'm talking about Brown too, mm -hmm. was, was really what needed to be done. Now, that's from a background of knowing what my justice wanted, knowing what some of the other justices wanted, knowing what the country could tolerate. And I thought, boy, the old guys have got it. They, they, they've hit it. Well, you know, there's been so much emphasis on that phrase that I think you forget that it's preceded by this language, which really explains what the court had in mind. The courts, meaning the district courts, will require that the defendants make a prompt and reasonable start toward full compliance right. with our May 17th ruling. Once such a start has been made, the courts may find that additional time is necessary to carry out the ruling in an effective manner. The burden rests upon the defendants to establish that such time is necessary in the public interest and is consistent with good faith compliance at the earliest practical time. That, that's the key. I really appreciate you bringing that up because I use the old, I say I use that term only to introduce <laughs> this point because that language is probably more important than the all deliberate speed, which grabbed the public's that's interest. Right. John, if I may interject a minute, please do. Score. A uh, comment Earl made a moment ago about Justice Black. He told me a couple of years later in a conversation that he thought at the time of Brown II, uh, as Earl mentioned, that the court should have ordered immediate admission of the named plaintiffs on a non segregated basis to the schools. But obviously, he didn't prevail on that point. And I don't know how hard he pressed it at the time, but he, two years later, he still was of that view. Uh, another aspect I might mention, he I recall a conversation with him shortly after the Brown II decision came down, and he told me what he was most worried about in this whole situation was that a lot of district judges across the South would be issuing injunctions against school board members and others, and then they would bring them up for contempt charges and try them for contempt without a jury. A black believed, contrary to what the law was, that there was a right to trial by jury on a criminal contempt charge. And he, uh, Probably was, stemming from his labor right. <laughs> uh, days. Yeah. Yeah. He was fearful that he would see rampant violation of that right as he saw it across the South, uh, viola tr trying people without a jury. Okay. Uh, but what, let, me, let me just please. for a minute uh, go back to the point of bringing it up to date. Uh, the, 
the language that uh, Barrett read, which is, I say, is important or more important than all the liberal speech, but I'm trying to go back and say the way we looked at it then. Mm -hmm. The way we looked at it then, I felt that the court had done a great service and had gotten unanimity, we'd gotten the ball rolling, we'd taken the cork out of the bottle, uh, Plessy was gone, uh, there was uh, uh, equal rights for people, you could start the ball rolling, and, and we had all done a wonderful thing. Since that time, 50 years, uh, all deliberate speed has become a bad word in many circles. Well, uh, well that's because so little has been done in some places. Well, but regardless of the reasons, in other words, what we thought that the court was doing which I thought was correct, you all can differ, but I thought was correct. Uh, and and I, I left the court uh, after my term uh, saying, you know, boy, I'm glad I was part of this. And now I read this stuff that uh, we should have done this and you should have, I say we, I mean the court, should have done this and should have done that and they should have done maybe what Black wanted or they should have put rules as to uh, you got to do it within a certain time frame, you have to do it in a certain way, uh, and that uh, uh, people have, uh, let me say this, in my own personal opinion, it has not worked the way I hoped it would. I thought, and I think the court felt, that there would be more support uh, in the South as well as in the nation to say, okay, now this is where we're going and this is the path we're going to. And, uh, and, and, and in the South particularly, we've got real problems. And I, I come from a border state, but it's more South than not. Uh, and we had our problems in Louisville. Uh, and we had uh, riots and we had not anything like <laughs> the other places, but we had bad things happen. But, uh, the people didn't get behind this thing and, and really help press it forward as that. Well, I, th I think the, the people who really should have gotten behind it uh, were the other two branches of the federal government. No, I do too. I mean, it was only with the uh, enactment of the uh, two Civil Rights Acts in 1964 and 1965. I don't think it would have made any difference at all. I think that critics of the decision simply have seized upon that as saying uh, this, the court uh, simply didn't uh, uh, show a sufficient uh, degree of militance or strength in uh, its implementation decision. And the, the other misconception, I think, is that um, many critics uh, will refer to all deliberate speed uh, to reflect their dissatisfaction with the fact that Negro students have not achieved equal educational opportunities or that there has not been achieved a marvelous racial balance in our schools. I think that is a misconception based on a misunderstanding of what the Brown decision was all about. It, it was not designed to achieve equality of educational opportunities. It was not designed to achieve racial balance. It was designed to end legally imposed segregation of the races in the public schools. It was not intended to be a panacea for all of the terrible problems that we did have then, and to a great extent we may still have today, in achieving uh, uh, not only legal equality, but uh, educational equality, social equality, and equality in other respects as well. So, to some extent, uh, all, the words all deliberate speed have become demonized as if, uh, if only the court hadn't used those three words, everything would have been different. That's simply 
does not reflect reality. But let me say I agree fully with that. If I can go back and pick up on the point uh, Gordon was saying, uh, unlike Gordon, I was not surprised uh, at what happened thereafter. I didn't expect uh, anything to happen. I, I say this enormous opposition and upset to it and so on. Uh, along that line, uh, LBJ, President Johnson, made a comment once that I thought was quite uh, thought-provoking. He said, we got things turned around the wrong way that the first step should have been the passage of the Voting Rights Act. And the political changes that that brought about, he didn't go on to spell it out, but what he was, I think, intending to say is that the political changes that brought about by that act would have resulted eventually in the elimination of segregation, at least in most places and many places. And so you would have had a political solution to the problem, which might have been better for the country in the long run. But I've often pondered over that scenario. If if that had happened that way, uh, what the Supreme Court's role might have been ultimately in it, it might have been much less than it was. At this point, uh, I'd like to take a short break. What you gentlemen have done much more effectively than I could have hoped for is really wrapped your arms around not only the story of Brown II, but the legacy question. After a short break, we'll return to some of that. Thank you. Good. I have an aside when we come back about <laughs> our work on the side. And Minton tried to get him uh, exempted. Yeah. Oh, that yeah. may be why oh, three I've justices. Got I've got a name, Lawrence Fordham. Is yeah, sure, third? Larry Fordham, yeah. So did he replace oh, wait a minute, Butler? Fordham. I don't even remember. Larry Ford Fordham was not the Iowa year, was he? I don't remember him. Yeah, he was there that year. Who was he playing for? Uh, well, the court, I've got the court's personnel roster. Either There's Burton or Minton, one of the two. It wasn't yeah. Burton. Minton. Minton. Yeah. It may have been Minton. He came in during the 54 term. Yeah. Well, uh, Butler left. We're yes. back on the air, gentlemen. Yeah. Butler left. Such as it is. <clears throat> Welcome <clears throat> back to Lene Theater at Chautauqua Institution. I'm Professor John Barrett. Uh, let's finish up our discussion of the Law Clerks Committee. Barrett Prettyman, of course, you were a participant in that. Well, I, I was just going to say as an aside <clears throat> that I have thought ever since uh, that time, 50 years ago, that it's been quite extraordinary that there's been so little comment about the fact that here you had a committee working inside the courthouse getting its own evidence together, submitting memos, factual and otherwise, to the court without anybody, any party to the court. Bill Coleman is there, and he will know that at the time, nobody, I think, uh, outside of <coughs> the uh, court knew that all of this evidence was being gathered and presented to the court. And since it's become known, uh, there's been no comment about it. The parties had no chance to uh, or critique it or uh, either defend it or attack it. Uh, uh, it was most extraordinary. Maybe uh, that's because it didn't reflect at all in the Brown II opinion. There's nothing to suggest, uh, with all due respect, that you've done any work. Right? Well, it wasn't. <laughs> 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 that, that's, that's what he's complaining about. <laughs> well, there was certainly no reference to it, but I do think it had uh, a very important effect, and that is, as I said before, I think it's one of the things that convinced the court that, A, it had to, uh, desegregation had to take place over a period of time, and B, the district courts had to be allowed a good deal of leeway in how they were going to handle it. I think our memo was directly uh, responsible for at least part of that. Uh, there again, I think you have to give credit to the Chief Justice who instituted the Committee of Six. Uh, and even though Reed had started it several years before, before my day, uh, for his own purposes, uh, and then had Jack Fassett take it to the chief at Reed's request, and the chief fell in love with it, so to speak, as, as an idea, and then he augmented it, and he deserves the credit for really following through with it and, uh, and distributing it to the other justices. Well, Earl, do, we, do you know, uh, you were in the chief's chambers, he was the recipient of this work product, uh, how he used it? Was he unrolling maps and looking at Spartanburg's 
residential patterns? I, sir, I do not recall that. Uh, mm. uh, I think uh, that uh, he obviously gave a good deal of consideration to it. My memory does not permit me to, to recall any specific uh, recollection about that. Let's move into the fall of 1954. Uh, one thing that was happening, you know, literally down the street from the Supreme Court building was the District of Columbia schools implementing integration. Uh, and it included some protest and riot and police uh, crowd control and so forth. Uh, was that something that the court was aware of or were you hermetically sealed and <laughs> concentrating on what you had in the building? Well, the justices read the newspapers, uh, some of them avidly, and um, they, they were well aware of what was going on, and they would get reports from friends from around the country. They'd get mail and so forth. I think they were well aware of what was going on, okay. both on their doorstep and elsewhere. Okay. Of course, the court knew that the desegregation in uh, District of Columbia had already started uh, even before Brown won. Uh, in October, well, in the fall, the court begins its term in October, and as it convened that fall, it scheduled the Brown II case for oral argument uh, in December. And within days, Justice Jackson died, and that schedule uh, <coughs> went out the window. Uh, share with us your memories of that process, the scheduling and the Jackson death and what that did to this dynamic. Uh, Barrett Prettyman, we'll start with you. You were Jackson's law clerk. Well, uh, of course, Justice Harlan was actually appointed fairly quickly, but... Um, nominated. Pardon me? Nominated. Yes. Not appointed. Uh, sorry. <laughs> <coughs> nominated. Right. Exactly. Big difference. <laughs> um, and uh, we all assumed, since he had been a very prominent New York uh, attorney uh, with a large firm and then on the Second Circuit, that he would very quickly be confirmed. And... Um, we were all surprised when it took, I guess, four months or so. Uh, there were all kinds of objections raised. And, um, but as I've already indicated, he and I were in touch immediately. He wanted work to start right away on the decree. He wanted to get up to speed, and he did. And, and uh, I think he spent uh, much time on it from, from then on until the uh, actual vote at conference. Um, getting up to speed on those cases. Right. Now, Harlan's grandfather had been a justice of the court and most famously was a dissenting justice in Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896. Uh, certainly that couldn't have been a reason why President Eisenhower selected him. Um, that did become part of the dynamic, didn't it, in that confirmation process and uh, a bit of the brown climate that surrounded the court? The big objection to Harlan, as I recall it, uh, was that he was uh, accused of being a one-worlder. Uh, he belonged to an organization called the Atlantic Union, as I recall, and he'd been put on the board of it, uh, which uh, advocated a sort of North American cooperation among nations, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, he said in his hearings that he had never attended a meeting of it, and it was a shame to say he never even paid his dues. and so on, but that was a big point of discussion, as I recall it, during the confirmation phase. Do you think he would be filibustered today? <laughs> he might be. He, well. had some, uh, he had a sizable uh, a vote against him. I think it was an order of maybe 17 or 20 senators voted against him. I was sitting in the gallery of the Senate the night he was confirmed and heard the closing debates, and I remember I went back to the chambers in the court and called Justice Black at home to tell him that uh, Harlan had been confirmed. I was mildly surprised at the sort of lack of reaction by Justice Black. It was as though I had told him that uh, I might be an hour late tomorrow morning. I, he showed no particular excitement or interest in the, in the information at all. I was rather disappointed. I thought I was giving him some exciting news. <laughs> well, don't you think that was because he anticipated that Justice Harlan would have uh, a number of views that were contrary to his, May have been, which yeah. turned out to be true? There but in was, the end, they turned out to be very warm friends. Oh, yes, very there, warm friends. There was a good bit of criticism, too, from a political standpoint, that of all the times in the world to appoint a Harlan, uh, Eisenhower did not use good political judgment 
in, in nominating another John Marshall Harlan yeah, right in the midst of this Brown against the school board situation. Uh, it was a minor type of thing. It was the kind of thing that Rush Limbaugh would have had. <laughs> uh, but uh, there was, uh, and it was sort of ironic that uh, the grandson of the great dissenter in the Plessy case was, was uh, put on the court to, in effect, overrule. He, didn't, he wasn't on when they overruled it, but he was there to second the motion and to, to uh, work on the mandate. So it was kind of an ironic uh, quirk of fate of all the people that could have been appointed that he appointed the grandson of the fellow who, who, who said originally Plessy was a mistake. You have to go back in history and kind of say, what if, uh, what if Harlan, see, uh, the grandfather, had been in the majority? You wouldn't have had Brown. Uh, you wouldn't have needed Brown. Mm -hmm. To go back to your point about the uh, term beginning and the effect and so on and so on, the, the huge dramatic news, of course, at the beginning of that term was Jackson's sudden death. Um, and I recall, to just drop a human interest footnote, my recollection is that the law clerks attended his funeral service in National Cathedral in a body. Uh, we sat together, as I recall it, in the uh, ga uh, balcony of the North Transept uh, for that service, and then all of the justices went on up here to New York uh, for the burial. But then the court operated as an eight-man court for about four or five months while the Harlan confirmation was pending, and he was finally confirmed in the middle of March. So most of the term, it was an eight-justice court. That also, of course, was uh, a midterm election year, uh, and this volatile issue uh, was perhaps of concern to voters. Is that of concern to the justices, dealing with a controversial issue during a midterm election year? I think that had part to do with the scheduling, from what I've read. Uh, you may know Earl more. There may have been discussion in your chambers, uh, but I think that some have said that it was not only the death of Justice Jackson and the appointment or the failure to confirm immediately Harlan, but also the fact that it was a midterm election, that they wanted to wait till that was over before they had the hearings on, uh, uh, on Brown too. Whether that's true or not, I don't know, but uh, it makes some sense that it would be. Once Harlan is confirmed and the court is back up to nine, uh, we're now in the winter, early spring of 1955. The, the Brown II case uh, is back on schedule. It's scheduled for oral argument in April. <coughs> the briefs have come in, and it's an enormous pile of briefs. Uh, did you have responsibility to review, summarize, deal with the briefing? Well, I've already mentioned that I summarized all of them for Justice Harlan okay. in my 50-page memo. Yes, we, we reviewed them. <clears throat> okay. Uh, were there surprises in the briefing? Uh, the states, the four states, of course, were involved in the cases. More states than that filed their briefs, the Eisenhower administration's brief, and, of course, the plaintiff's side brief, briefing filed by the NAACP. I was more surprised by the oral argument than I was by the briefs. Uh, I was, too, and, and somewhat shocked. Uh, now, I may have been a naive young uh, somebody who uh, was easily shocked. Uh, I remember vividly the argument of uh, J. Lindsay Allman, the Attorney General of Virginia, uh, who later became governor. I suppose on the basis of the way he argued the case, <laughs> which was one of the most horrible things I've ever heard. Uh, his, uh, he had many points, but one of his major points was that uh, you should not order any immediate uh, integration. Uh, he didn't, uh, that's an important point, too, if I may make a uh, sad remark. <coughs> Justice Reed was always very certain uh, that you understood, uh, that he understood, I think it was more for his benefit than anybody else, that the, the Brown case was desegregation. It was not integration. 
that there was never the whole an, busing thing and so forth yeah, came much later. That, much so later. Nobody talked about and, busing. But it was very important to those guys who were having troubles with the case <clears throat> to say it's desegregation. We don't argue. We don't. We're not commanding integration. Well, if I could just yes. interrupt you for a Please. moment on that, yeah. it's instructive that both Brown opinions do not use the phrase integration. Absolutely not. Right. In fact, with Brown too, one of the things I remember about it, I was in the courtroom when Warren read the opinion of Brown too, and about half a dozen times or more, several times, the word discrimination is used and never is the word segregation or desegregation used in the opinion. So I went back right after I uh, heard it, uh, saw Justice Black in his chambers, and I commented on this point. I said, uh, uh, I noticed the use of the word discrimination throughout the opinion, never mentioning segregation, desegregation, which is what Brown 1 was all about, and I'm a little puzzled over that, and all Black did, he sort of smiled slightly and said, well, I think they'll understand what we mean. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, let's return to uh, the oral argument of Lindsey Allman. What, what did he do that was so shocking? <clears throat> what was shocking to me was that a major thrust of his argument <clears throat> was that the court should not uh, order integration or rapid desegregation, however you want to phrase it, uh, because, among other reasons, of the uh, trouble with the blacks, health, their criminal records, uh, their uh, lack of, the, of intelligence or lack of learning or inability, and particularly I remember, and this was, it was late in the afternoon. Uh, nobody else seems to remember this, so maybe, <laughs> maybe I'm dreaming, but uh, he stood before the court and uh, there was a little light coming through. It was a very dramatic scene from my standpoint. <coughs> and this, and, and uh, uh, Almond looked like he was from central casting. He, <laughs> he was absolutely had white hair <coughs> and he <coughs> perfectly quaffed. And uh, he, he said, uh, uh, and I must quote the venereal disease among the blacks. Uh, that uh, is so much greater than the whites, and tuberculosis, and uh, uh, unwed mothers, and uh, but he kept going back to the venereal disease, and uh, and uh, to put these children together is a mistake at this time. Well, I I, I just I, I cringed in this great hall of justice to hear that type of argument being made, and. Uh, so I was the two uh, the two who shocked me the most were uh, the fellow from South Carolina, Emory Rogers, and the fellow from North Carolina, Beverly, uh, the woman Beverly Lake, because they were in effect telling the court it had no power in this area. I mean, they were still re arguing round one, mm -hmm. and at one point the chief. Uh, <laughs> I remember he, he was shocked, and he said to one of them, are you trying to tell me that, uh, that you will not obey the order of this court? And the, the, the answer was not quite, that's what I'm saying, but he said it in a way that strongly implied that we aren't going to integrate. I think, I think it was Rogers uh, who was asked by the Chief Justice, uh, you mean to tell me that you, you're not prepared to make an honest effort to desegregate? And Rogers replied, well, let's get honest out of there. <laughs> Chief Justice replied, no, let's keep it right in there. And <laughs> That's he, exactly he, right. He was outraged. Yeah. Um, I heard all these arguments, too, and I well remember. It uh, went on for four days. Right, this was four days. And I well remember the arguments you were talking about. I had two reactions to them <laughs> myself. One was it was rather poor advocacy that uh, this was not the way to persuade the court to do anything you might want them to do. That was the main reaction I had. The other was this, that however shocking or unpleasant it might be, those people were expressing widely held views in their states. Oh, absolutely. So they were accurately saying what the sentiment was. <clears throat> now, th those let, are... Let me, let me finish please. up one <clears throat> thing, because I've got to give credit to uh, 
uh, Thurgood Marshall again. And that is, at the end of all these arguments, uh, the court gave uh, uh, Justice Marshall, then Attorney Marshall, the right to respond. Mm -hmm. And he responded, as you recall, by states, pretty much. He said, South Carolina argues this, and uh, Virginia argues this. And when he got to Virginia and Almond's argument, he stopped for a moment, and he was a handsome, impressive figure. Uh, and he stopped for a moment, and he said, it's very interesting to me that the Attorney General of Virginia argues that the health, well-being, and venereal disease of the blacks should prevent their being put together with the white school children. And he stopped again and he said, those are the same black syphletic venereal hands who fed four generations of Virginians and still do it today and raised five presidents of the United States. <laughs> and yet the children can't go to school together. <laughs> And I'll tell you, there wasn't a dry eye in me. I don't know about the rest of the people, but it was a moving experience. Now, Marshall, and you, you've anticipated my question, Marshall, among the plaintiff's attorneys, was powerfully and directi directly asking the court for the forthwith integration remedy <clears throat> that many would say logically flows from the Constitutional Declaration of Brown I. And these excellent attorneys, Robert Carter, Jim Nabritt, Spotswood Robinson, Thurgood Marshall, each in the various cases they're arguing are presenting that argument directly to the court. That's the argument that was already off the table uh, in the justices' mind, if I'm understanding the earlier conversation. Is that correct? Well, that's my that's view. That's my feeling, That's too. my view. <laughs> and the, uh, the lawyers didn't know that. We knew that. Well, I... I from a litigation strategy standpoint, I could understand that. I think, first of all, uh, the NAACP had its own political problems uh, in terms of uh, uh, getting the, the backing of uh, its very large group of members and this is pure speculation on my part, but it might well have been uh, impossible for the NAACP lawyers to have taken a more modest, uh, gradualist position. Or secondly, as a matter of litigation strategy, it's not unusual for plaintiffs uh, to ask in their complaints or in their ad dominums for perhaps more than they actually expect that they're going to get, but perhaps recognizing that that could have some effect on, on what they ultimately will get. So uh, I, I think it would be uh, very interesting to hear uh, what uh, Mr. William Coleman might comment on that uh, this evening. Uh, because he, I think, perhaps uh, was one of the few lawyers uh, in the NAACP group uh, that advised Marshall not to seek a forthwith remedy, but instead to accept uh, a, a gradualist approach. And Coleman, after all, was, as far as I know, the only... NACP lawyer involved in that group who had had the experience of being a law clerk at the Supreme Court and who perhaps had a perception of what the court would accept as distinguished from, let's say, what a very good lawyer who did not have that experience might think would be the desirable strategy 
So this is pure speculation on my part. Uh, I have to believe that in their heart of hearts, uh, someone as sophisticated as Thurgood Marshall probably recognized that he wasn't going to get that court to accept a forthwith remedy. There is a, a, an excerpt, uh, I assume completely accurate, of a phone call that Thurgood Marshall made after Brown II to one of his colleagues. And he said, what do you think of it? And uh, the fellow said, well, it could have been this, could have been that. And uh, Marshall said, I'm tickled to death with it. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. Did your justices have any comments to you in that post-oral argument moment before they retire to their conference to discuss how they're going to vote and write this? Or was oral argument simply something to take in? Well, I'm sure uh, we did because uh, Bill Lifflin was the other law clerk and the justice talked to us about just about everything. <clears throat> but I don't recall, I, <clears throat> I think he went into the conference simply uh, very well prepared in terms of all of the arguments and the pros and the cons. But I think he was, after all, the junior man, and I think he was prepared to go along with anything that sounded sensible. Right. Among the others of you, any justice comment? The, only thing, I, the only thing I remember was how angry Warren still was about some of the uh, arguments presented by the uh, state's lawyers. So as I've said, Justice Black never discussed the case at all, so there was none. None. <laughs> now, in, in April, just a couple of days after those four days of oral arguments, the justices have their conference. Uh, and out of that conference emerges, uh, of course, the unanimous decision written by Chief Justice Warren. <clears throat> was there any prospect of a divided court here, or were they simply in a, a drafting phase as a unanimous body, as you understood it as law clerks? As far as I knew, it, it was a fait accompli. I mean, uh, uh, they had satisfied, I think, uh, all of the concerns of, of certainly of Justice Reed and, and uh, I assume of the other justices. So. Earl, were, were there various drafts or was the original draft essentially uh, uh, what came The original out? draft, my recollection is, and I, and I must say I based some of mine on my <laughs> recent reading, uh, preparatory to this uh, program uh, was that uh, Frankfurter had a couple suggestions which as we all know is not unusual uh, and uh, there were a couple other comments uh, suggestions but it was sort of a, a non-event uh, I don't do you remember Earl any any I thought it flowed well uh, Frankfurter uh, and I, I don't know whether th this occurred before the, the Chief Justice draft was circulated, uh, you know, by way of a private meeting or a memo from fr uh, with Frankfurter, or whether it was subsequent. I, I think it had to be before that because uh, I, I don't, as far as I know, Black was the only one that made a change in the draft that was circulated. But Frankfurter. I believe was the one who uh, <coughs> proposed the use of the term uh, all deliberate speed, which he apparently had found in a uh, old equity opinion of uh, Holmes. 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 Yeah. Right. And who got uh, it from a poem somewhere in England. Yeah. Well, they think he got it from a poem. They <laughs> <laughs> and, and the Hounds of Heaven right. by an old uh, uh, writer, an uh, English. Uh, uh, Catholic theologian type writer who wrote The Hounds of Heaven and used the term. And, uh, right. Frankfurter so. is, is fighting for that phrase and, and eventually prevails on the Chief Justice to include it very, very late in the month of May. Um, before that time, obviously, there's a drafting process and the circulation to the other justices. How did the drafting process happen in Chief Justice Warren's chambers, Earl? I can't recall specifically. I know Jerry Gunther, uh, I think, was shepherding this through the different drafts and in, in, in making changes that uh, uh, the chief directed. Um, 
The only thing that I remember very clearly was that there was no dispute about the the basic draft that the uh, chief distributed, uh, except insofar as uh, Black uh, and Douglas, who joined Black on that, in a, asking for the deletion of any references to the class actions. Mm -hmm. And what was the thinking about avoiding that phrase, class action? Well, Dan may be in a better position to comment on that. My understanding uh, is that, uh, number one, Black did not like uh, the concept of class actions. And number two, uh, he did not foresee the, uh, even uh, the possibility that there could be uh, large-scale desegregation in the South. Number three, I think he felt, uh, as you suggested before, that there's a certain logic in saying that once a constitutional right has been declared, it should follow that that would be implemented, which I think led him to the view that the specific named plaintiffs, only a handful, should be given immediate admission, and consistent with that, you eliminate the reference to the class actions, and so that the whole problem of implementation, as far as he was concerned, would be essentially a very minimal process. I, I don't understand the logic of it, because Brown one specifically stated that these are class actions, and it's because they are class actions that we have to uh, have a separate argument and decision on how this should be implemented. But because, Brown two makes no reference because the complexity. Mm -hmm. But then, uh, and then after Brown two is decided, the cases are remanded to the district courts, and those cases were class actions when they are brought, and they were, were, were class actions on remand, and the, ju the district judges had to deal with the class action problems. So I uh, remain confused as to what precisely was the rationale that uh, Justice Black, who's a very smart man, uh, had in that. Maybe, maybe Dan has some thoughts well, on all that. Well, the only light I can shed on that is a conversation I had with him a couple of years later, in which he said uh, he was still convinced they should have ordered immediate admission on a non-segregated basis of the named plaintiffs. And my, I'm, I, this is guesswork, but I have a feeling that he uh, may have thought that would have lessened uh, the adverse reaction to it in the South, that it would be limited in its immediate impact, uh, and you leave everything else for another day and so on. But that's, that's pretty much guesswork on my part. I, I can't shed much more light on it than that. It's pretty oh. interesting that <clears throat> in one of these things that I've been reading, uh, that in one of, uh, and Earl, you may know more about this, in one of uh, Justice, uh, Chief Justice Warren's memoirs or a <clears throat> book about him or whatever, uh, he stated that he had received so much acclaim for getting a unanimous verdict and doing this, the wise things, and this was shortly after the, the, the two cases. <clears throat> but that he, this was a quote, uh, that he gave credit uh, to the way this thing was handled to the Southern justices. Do you remember that? Uh, to Clark uh, and to Black and to Reed. Oh, yes. Uh, as being the ones who really knew the problem and who, uh, when they went along, uh, that they Well, not, really not, only, not only did they know the problem, but I think he felt that it was much easier for the Northern justices to agree that the South <laughs> should desegregate. And he recognized that for these justices like Black, who uh, grew up in the Deep South, represented the Deep South, that that was really a tremendous revolution in thinking on the part of Black. 
And, he, and I think he recognized how black and others, in particular black, would be vilified as he was in, the, in his own home area Whenever for, he home. <laughs> for having sold out the South so that this was a great sacrifice and, and it was a, a, to a great extent a, a patriotic statesmanlike move on the part of uh, black quite contrary to what uh, his natural self-interest might appear to be. You know, it's interesting that this decree is, is, uh, is short, concise, and simple in the same way that Brown one was. It doesn't mention, just by way of example, two of the questions that the justices posed to the parties for them to address on the argument about the decree related to the possible use of special masters. Right. There's nothing in here about special masters. It doesn't say you can have them or you can't have them. It just ignores the mm. whole subject. And uh, there were a number of things <clears throat> kind of rattling around there uh, that are just never dealt with at all. All right. Uh, let's turn to decision day. <coughs> Tuesday, May 31, 1955. It's the day after Memorial Day. The justices take the bench at noon, announce decisions. This is the second one. Were you in the court, and was it a momentous announcement? I was there black uh, a few minutes before 12. Uh, says to us, you might want to be in the courtroom this morning. I was he there. Left. You were there. Mm -hmm. I was there. I was there. <laughs> and never before has the words, which we all as lawyers considered sort of pro forma, but never before uh, or since have I ever uh, gloried in the words that are at the end of the opinion and it is so ordered. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Benito. <laughs> <laughs> the descriptions of the Brown One announcement, and, and of course two of you were there a year earlier, include the, the kind of gasp in the courtroom when Warren <coughs> uses the word unanimous and so forth. Was there that kind of palpable experience as Brown Two was being announced? No. I'm, no. I'm, I didn't sense it anyway. No, I think it was more of uh, not routine, but uh, it was uh, uh, not uh, involving uh, the kind of emotional reaction that... Uh, and I think part of that was that uh, one of the reactions was, what does that mean? <laughs> 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 what are they saying? <laughs> well, I, you know, it's yeah. interesting uh, on this question of secrecy and not <clears throat> talking to the clerks and talking to the clerks and uh, the change of uh, the particular attention that was given to Brown One, particularly more so than Brown Two, uh, uh, as Dan said, that Justice Black didn't really discuss it at all. Uh, is that right, Dan? I mean, right. Um, Reed, of course, did discuss it a lot, so I understand with from Facet. But uh, the two justices that are reported to. The rule was that, I mean, it was, you know, I don't know what your experience was, uh, Barrett, but because once Justice Jackson appeared in, in, the, in, the, in the court in that 54, day, yes. uh, the electricity went out that <laughs> something special is going to happen. But the two justices that are reported to have said something to their clerks on the way to the robing room, uh, I'm talking about one now, mm -hmm. which was the secretive one, uh, was uh, Justice uh, uh, Clark who said to his clerks on his way through their office, uh, I think you boys ought to be in, court, or be in court today. And Justice Reed did the same thing to Fassett and, and Mickham. That's what Black did on Brown too, you know. Did he? Did yeah, he? Right. Yeah. Same thing. Well, well we, we sort of knew that Brown <laughs> too was coming down. I don't know how I knew that. but. Mm. Well, Maybe Barrett called me on. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Barrett, you've raised the question of a listener wondering what it meant. Uh, and I recognize it's 50 years ago. But when one reads the opinion, I must say that it's filled with a lot more push on the accelerator than lift off the accelerator. Um, you've read some of these phrases, prompt and reasonable start, 
burden rests on the defendants to establish that delay is necessary, good faith compliance, uh, and I must add to that list, admission with all deliberate speed, the parties to these cases. I think even all deliberate well, speed was, is a, it was a push phrase. It was perfectly clear that they, something had to begin right away. Right. But I think what people didn't, couldn't quite understand, and I'm not sure <laughs> they still do, is then what? I mean, how long do you get? Do you do it by classes? Do you do it, uh, do, do you have uh, six months or 10 years or a lifetime? I mean, what, what does that mean? And my impression was outside the courtroom was what I would describe as sort of a collective sigh of relief across the South, mm -hmm. that we're mm -hmm. off the hook immediately. Right. And what this meant was sort of for another day and right. so on. It didn't have a deadline. It didn't right. have a calendar. Oh, and that, that, of course, was a point that was argued uh, I mean, within the court and oh, uh, in the court and in the chambers, was should it contain? And you remember this, Earl. All of you do very well. Should it contain some guidelines? In other words, should it say? Well, uh, should it contain a, or, a deadline? Yeah, uh, and, and should and, uh, it? Say, I think the feeling you was ought to do this and you ought to do that. You have to do it by such a time. That was that was a. A point of uh, discussion. In retrospect, it's hard to see how the court could have done anything other than what it did. That's mm -hmm. my feeling. <laughs> because a deadline, <laughs> let's say five years, would then become nobody would do anything for five years. Right. 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 That was the problem with a deadline. And right. a deadline was asked for by just a few states, not really. Uh, As practical. I said earlier, I left the court that day feeling that I'd done a momentous service to my country. You Not did. that I'd done a damn thing, but uh, <laughs> uh, I felt good about it. Well, of course, given the uh, tremendous unfinished business of this country, many revisionist critics look back on Brown II, the decree, as a missed opportunity, that the court should have done so much more, be it a deadline, be it a decree, be it specific requirements. Uh, against that, I'd like to read you a note that Justice Frankfurter sent to Chief Justice Warren uh, that afternoon. Dear Chief, the harvest of today's planting won't be fully assessed for many a day. For me, it's a safe bet that the wisest historian of the court, a half a century hence, will acclaim the long-headed wisdom of what your opinion said, and not less so what it didn't say. In any event, I am content. Yours faithfully, FF. And let me tell you, that last sentence from Frankfurt is remarkable. <laughs> well, this is in I never knew him to be content, did you? Well, <laughs> I, I, this, is, this just strikes me as a typical Frankfurt ploy uh, to curry favor with the chief. Mm -hmm. I, I would ask you to assess the note and also perhaps to locate yourselves between the harsh criticism of modern hindsight and the contentment at least the professed contentment this of Justice Frankfurter of those, uh, in 1955. This is one of those situations where it is very easy to, uh, to, uh, to carve, uh, if you will, to find fault with what the court did or didn't do. It is much more difficult to turn around and say precisely what they should have done. Um, forthwith, I am convinced, would have been ignored and uh, then what would have happened? Once anybody got away with doing nothing, uh, would that have spread? I don't know. But um, just as there were, there was a book out on what Brown One should have said, where academics wrote their own opinions, all of which were ten times worse than what the court did. Uh, so here too, I think it is easy to say, well, they should have done more, but, to, uh, but it's difficult to put your finger on exactly what they should have done that they didn't do. I'm not saying they necessarily did the right thing. I'm just saying this was a difficult problem. I think the question of uh, how you evaluate round two depends on what uh, was expected from the decision. Uh, if what was expected, if what was expected was uh, the end of uh, black poverty, uh, equality of educational opportunity for black children, uh, racial balance, uh, 
then Brown 2 is a failure. But uh, if you judge Brown 2 in terms of what was the only function it could undertake to perform, given the limitations of law, that is ending the uh, horrifying compulsory segregation of blacks and whites in public schools, it has proved to be a major success. It took too long, but desegregation has been accomplished. So a number of critics say, well, but segregation still continues because you have uh, some schools that are almost all black and you have other schools that are all white and then so the, uh, and in addition in some places where there had been racial balance there now is what is called quote resegregation unquote well that's a, a, a whole different issue that deals with uh, concentration of blacks in particular areas reflecting, which is reflected in uh, the, the balance racially of the schools that they attend. Uh, that was not the objective, nor could it have been the objective of Brown to change that. I think to a great extent, critics of Brown uh, engage in a play on words in the word segregation they uh, easily move from legally imposed segregation to what is called de facto segregation, that is, the fact that there may be a lack of racial balance. And I think that uh, does a great disservice to uh, analyzing where we are in racial relations, and it certainly does a great disservice to uh, what the court sought to accomplish and could possibly accomplish in 1954 and 1955. One of the principal uh, re revisionists, critics of uh, Brown is a colleague of uh, Dan's at the University of Virginia, uh, Cl Professor Clarman, who wrote a superb book uh, that has been highly honored. and. Uh, uh, it's interesting what position he takes about Brown II. He says that Brown II was a mistake from the court's perspective was quickly apparent. In the next paragraph, he says, to say that Brown II was misguided is not to say that the justices calculated foolishly. Then he goes on to say, in retrospect, the justices should have been firm and imposed deadlines and specific desegregation requirements. Then he asks, well, did their miscalculation matter much? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, most white Southerners would oppose desegregation until they were convinced that resistance was futile and costly. The court was powerless to make that showing on its own. And it seems to me that even on the basis of Clarman's uh, very recent uh, magisterial attempt to make a revisionist criticism of Brown I and Brown II, I think those decisions come out very well. I come at it from a slightly different standpoint. I think that Brown I and II, although they were very carefully limited internally to education, actually began a revolution outside of education uh, because uh, you, 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 you not only got your Civil Rights Act, but you've got uh, blacks who well, began to vote more, began to put more blacks in public office. I mean, the landscape today is just nothing like it was in the early I, 50s. I, I couldn't, couldn't agree more with, uh, with Barrett. Uh, to me, the great glory of the Brown cases, one and two, uh, was as I said earlier, I think that it 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 opened the faucet, it it pulled the plug, it let the flow of equality and governmental intervention to be sure that 
that the rights were protected and equal protection became a reality rather than a myth. And uh, I think it was uh, a monument, regardless of the cases themselves involving the schools, it was, it was the beginning of something that, of course, should have occurred in this nation many years before. But at least it did occur, and it did occur in Brown. And you go back and think what fate did to get Brown. Uh, you have to go back to the Roosevelt appointees. Uh, would Brown have come without the Roosevelt appointees? I don't know. Uh, would, would things have been different if, if uh, the New Deal hadn't come along? Uh, I'm not <laughs> arguing the democratic point of view. I'm saying how fate plays into these things. So you, if you had a court with a Chief Justice of Fred Vinson, who happened to be a, a, a colleague uh, in, graduated from the same college I did, <laughs> good friend, <laughs> friend of the family, a very fine man. But had he been Chief Justice, uh, would, that, would that have happened now? If Roosevelt had not appointed Black, uh, Reed perhaps, certainly Douglas, you know, it, it, it opened the floodgates to what should have been done many years ago. One of the extraordinary things about it, jurisprudentially speaking, is that uh, the court put enormous emphasis on public education in the Brown decision. Uh, that was the whole thrust of it, the uniqueness, distinctiveness of education in relation to the separate but equal doctrine. But then you turn around a year or two later and suddenly, uh, without much explanation, uh, segregation on golf courses, uh, buses, everything else. Rest, goes. Hotel. Uh, and I've never seen any uh, real, no, no efforts been able to, uh, made to explain that on the part of the court. It's rather extraordinary, jurisprudential kind of twist. Well, I think I can offer a suggestion. Right. And that yeah. is that uh, the court was trying to stick to what uh, is often regarded as a, a key uh, principle of constitutional interpretation, and that is, thou shalt make constitutional interpretations as narrowly as possible. Uh, and I think in, in Brown, I think the, another reason for that was that uh, the problem of getting acceptance with respect to public education was in itself such a massive undertaking that uh, I think the court was quite interested in trying to limit the, uh, the scope of the ruling as much as possible. But it was obvious that once Brown came down, the same thing, principle would have to apply to courthouses, parks, swimming pools, uh, every other kind of public facilities. And uh, it worked out so nicely that the court Supreme Court did not even have to rule on that. Uh, what happened was there were a series of lower court decisions applying Brown 1 to these various kinds of public facilities. Certiorari was sought in the Supreme Court. Certiorari was denied. Uh, well, you had an appeal from a three-judge court, which was summarily affirmed. Right, summarily affirmed, no, no opinion, <laughs> just an order. And the court never had to really get to, uh, That's what I'm to get into it was that. Never explained how you jump from public education <laughs> to those fields. Well, I know that uh, you're right because, uh, as I've mentioned before, uh, in a different setting, Justice Jackson had a few changes, suggested changes in in Brown one, and uh, uh, the Chief Justice rejected one of them specifically because it could have applied outside of education, and he, being the grand politician that he was very definitely wanted this to relate solely to, uh, to um, education. And I, I think part of it was that he thought that that was about as much as people could absorb at one time. But don't you think he also that. knew that this was, as Earl has said, it, it was the beginning of a flow? Of course he did. Uh, yeah. the, so he didn't have to do it. Because, well, you know, it all depends, Dan, you know, what you regard as the crux of Brown 1. Uh, in my own view, Brown one was rejecting the underpinning of Plessy, which said that uh, 
you recall, if blacks uh, see uh, an inferior status imposed on them by segregation, that's just their own imagination or that's their own perception. And to me, that was the fundamental aspect of it. And then the effect of that on, brown, on black students was in effect the application of that broader principle. So that when the question of the application of Brown one uh, came up with respect to, let's say, golf courses or courthouses, I think a lower court reading Brown one appropriately would have said it is impossible for us to reach a different determination here, even though we're dealing with a different kind of public facility. On, on that note, I'm sure you will all join me in thanking our guests. I, I'm speaking without direct contact with the justices, but I feel confident that 50 years since Brown II, they would agree that these law clerks continue to perform extraordinary service. And it's been a pleasure to have Barry Prettyman, Dan Metter, Earl Pollock, and Gordon Davidson here today on behalf of the Jackson Center and the Supreme Court Historical Society. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. What a pleasure to see you again. Barrett. Are you leaving? Tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning.